Welcome in. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited for our, our discussion. If you could just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and we'll get started. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Abdi Mohammed. I'm a, currently a cybersecurity engineer for Lockheed Martin. I've been in the cybersecurity space for about three, four, three, three plus years. And, you know, um, I'm very glad to be here. Originally from San Diego, California, went to San Diego State, tried to study economics, become an economist, but that didn't work out, pivoted to IT. And then, you know, was in to told by my mentors, hey, you should look in the cyber end. Got my first cyber job fresh out of college and moved to Orlando from San Diego, moved to Georgia uh, back in January. And here I am today. How cool. So you currently find you in Georgia right now? Yeah, in Georgia. Yeah, basically. How Georgia. cool. Um, so you slightly already mentioned there. What was your uh, transition like into just getting started in the uh, security sector or even in the technology industry as a whole? What were your obstacles that you faced? And <laughs> on top of that, you know, if you could share with us your obstacles, how would you recommend uh, the Abdi of 18 years old get started in the technology field? That's a, that's a great question. That's a loaded question. That's, that's a so great so question. We'll, we'll break it apart. Let's just start with the first yeah. one then. So, so what was your experience like transitioning into, into security? Let's that's a great that. question. So <laughs> what I, what I, um, so fresh out of high school, I was a medical record specialist. Mm. So my job was scanning medical, physical medical records and converting them into a digital med medical records. And the reason why we were doing that was to make, uh, was to, so patients, so patients can have access to medical records through a, a web application, right? Mm. And uh, the reason, another reason why we did that is because of uh, to be compliant with HIPAA, HIPAA compliance. Yes. So, and HIPAA compliance is pretty big in the medical uh, medical industry. So I did that for four years while I was an undergrad. And uh, my friend, on my fourth year, my senior year of college, he recommended that hey, you know, you should you should you know, get this internship at San Diego State. And uh, I worked, I worked as an intern for a year for my senior year at San Diego State doing, you know, mm -hmm. basic IT tasks, you know, um, re-imaging computers, yeah. you know, moving desktops, mm -hmm. setting up uh, computers for, um, like for a help desk admin. technician. Yeah, kind of like, kind of like a help desk technician. Did yeah. a little bit of vulnerability scanning. And then it wasn't oh, nice. until one of my friends you know, um, he told me how much he was making in cyber. I was like, oh my God, I don't want to make that that much money. So, and also uh, after doing my own research as well, realizing that that the cybersecurity industry is still is still growing at a significant rate. It's still um, it's still pretty, in my opinion, um, relatively like new, relatively early. I mean, it's been yeah. around, but it's like there's so much room for growth in the cybersecurity industry. You know, there's folks from all different disciplines, you know, pivoting into this industry, you know, from your your cyber psychologists, your your uh, pen tester to your cyber compliance. Guy, cyber psychologist. Yeah, there are, folks who, there are folks titled cyber psychologists who study who study how um, the psychology behind, you know, why hackers do what they do. Why? Why criminals really? behave the way they cyber criminals behave the way that they behave. Interesting. Wow. How cool. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, the industry is pretty big, but for me, uh, my my biggest challenge uh, getting into a cyberspace, I'd say, was just being, I guess, naive and ignorant. Um, how so? You know, I didn't I didn't realize how because because it, it took me from my my senior year, like my my fourth year, all mm -hmm. all of my fifth my, my well. My fifth year as a as an undergrad, right? I graduated in five years, so my fifth year it took it took eight to nine months of my fifth year. So it wasn't until spring semester where I was about to graduate where I landed a role. So I was applying from the summer from my fourth year to my fifth year, all wow, the way okay. to to the end of my uh, end of my uh, collegiate uh, collegiate tenure. So mm -hmm. my biggest mistake was I just didn't know how much work it required to land a role within within tech because mm -hmm. I. I was under the presumption, well, if I have a degree, I'll easily be able to apply for yeah. a job and get the job, you know, and most mm -hmm. of us, most of us, you know, younger folks, who, you know, we have this idea where if we just get the degree, we do the internship, you know, automatically, yes, we're going to get the job, but that mm -hmm. wasn't, that wasn't the case for me, you know, and I'm sure. Have you found that to be the case for most, where like you go, you study, you spend your four years trying to get a degree, 
And then people come to realize, wait a minute, all this time I was being told I would actually get this uh, degree and then that would lead me to a job. But it turns out, you know, the degree was really just a check mark as mm-hmm. part of getting the actual job. Have you found that to be the case with most people? Oh, that, yeah, that's most definitely. Yeah. That's definitely the case, you know, where I have, I've had, I've had plenty, I've had, I won't say plenty, but I've had people reach out to me literally a week before graduation say, hey, Abdi, I need help finding a job. Mm-hmm. And my thing is like, hey, you do realize that the time for you to apply for jobs is like your junior year or even before that, mm-hmm. like, like you, you got to think long term, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're in college, you, you got to understand, you, I'm not saying your degree is not valuable, you know, especially yeah. those of us who are in the STEM fields. I'm not saying your degree isn't valuable, but you have to understand that, you know, it's a, it's a competitive market and a degree is just not going to guarantee you, mm-hmm. you know, employment. What's going to, I like to think of this as a game of probabilities, right? So mm-hmm. you get the degree that increases your probability of employment, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, you have your at home, you have your home lab projects mm-hmm. and that increases your probability of employment. You're networking mm-hmm. on social media sites like LinkedIn and you're going yes. to network events throughout offered through your respective college campus. See mm-hmm. now, now, you know, you're getting out there. You have the, the project experience and you know you have a degree. You you're you're pretty competitive at that point. You know mm-hmm. within your within your um your your space because most folks most of us who are during undergrad we're not doing this thing right. We're not mm-hmm. we're not going to enough networking events. You know where before we're graduating right before the yeah. year we're graduating we're not mm-hmm. establishing relationships with you know recruiters early on because a lot you know it, it's crazy because there are recruiters that come on campus you know and they're there to, to get students, you know, build relationships with students and offer internships. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, there are organizations on campus, on college campuses that, are, that have uh, that have conferences and workshops throughout the year mm-hmm. where students can go to and they can build relationships with, with uh, prospective employers, you know, whether that be the Lockheed Martin, the Boeing, the Amazon, the Microsoft, whatever, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's, it's the, the biggest challenge uh, for me was understanding, you know, hey, what I would have told the younger, I'd be like, hey, the time for you to look for roles, you know, is not when you're the year you're about to graduate. It's way before that. It's setting you. You got to be able to set yourself up for the next play in the timely manner. Gotcha. Okay. And so, transitioning into you know speaking to Abdi, eighteen year old Abdi, mm-hmm. what kind of roadmap would you say for someone who is eighteen or who is in maybe university, or even maybe high school? What kind of roadmap would you recommend after? Because I know you know you have your several experience within Lockheed Martin as a security lead, as a um, as a consultant, right? So you've had some experience. You've been able to t- uh, taste, uh, you know, get some experience within the security field. What sort of roadmap would you sort of recommend for people who want to either dive into security, or if you feel even more comfortable with it, uh, in uh, DevOps, or even both? We can do both. <laughs> That's a great question. Um... You know, with I might get canceled for this, but a lot of entry level <laughs> roles, there, 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 a lot of entry level roles are OJT on the job training. Mm. You know, and um, I'm pretty confident that if I was fresh out of high school, would I have been able to do my uh, my first job with mm-hmm. OJ on the J on the job first cyber job on the job training? Yeah, you know, mm. and uh, I think if if, you, if you're 18. What I what I recommend is pretty much focus on your base, learn basic IT fundamentals, mm-hmm. you know. And so, it, what would that it, look like? You know, that could be you know, um, you know, pursuing I guess probably pursuing A plus certification. You know, understanding what's a server, what's a what's a network, okay. what's a switch, what's a router. Okay. Um, yeah, difference between TCP, uh, UDP. Gotcha. You know, what's okay. an IP address? Mm-hmm. You know, just basic building blocks. What's you know, what's a computer? You know, what's pretty a, much. What's, okay. Yeah, what's a memory card? Got you know, what's it. What's okay. a what's a disk? What's a disk drive? That's what you mm-hmm. think. So, you know, get your fundamentals. I would say begin studying the fundamentals, and then obviously with with your question, it also brings the question up of, okay, do I go to college or not? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, college for me, the, the way I look at college is it's an economical decision. It's a financial decision. Mm-hmm. So what do I mean by that? It's a decision where you 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 have to calculate the return on investment by pursuing yes. it, right? Mm-hmm. And for some people at eighteen, I don't believe college is the answer for them. They probably yeah. they probably be much better off, you know, doing an apprenticeship, 
mm-hmm. you know, and, and working, learning under someone and having the respective company that they eventually get employed under pay for their bachelor's degree, right? Um, mm-hmm. Degrees are not cheap. They're getting more expensive. Yes, it's getting, it's getting worse. So. And I think it's going to keep getting worse until there's something mm-hmm. done, right? Yeah. And I was fortunate I didn't have student loans because I qualified for a significant amount of financial aid coming from a low-income mm-hmm. family. Yeah. That's a privilege, right? To not pay pay much for college, right? I, I, I Most of it was covered, right? But there are folks, you know, middle-class, middle-income families who are paying for college, who are mm-hmm. folks who are taking loans out. And, you know, you, no one, I believe at age 18, you know, you can get as much advice as you can, but ultimately it has to be up to you and you have to be able to own that decision. So, okay. you know, do I recommend going to college? Well, it depends. Do you have the, the financial means, the appropriate means of going to college? Or do you have a threshold of how much loans are you going to take? Mm, you know, okay. instead of going straight to university, you might want to go to community college because I think in states like California, you know, community college is free, you know, you know, and it's much cheaper okay. than going to yes. uh, straight to university. I think a lot of young folks are sold this idea of the collegiate college experience. Yes. But, okay. you know, you have to understand college is a great time. It's a fun time. But mm-hmm. more importantly, you have to you cannot you cannot lose focus on why are you there in the first place? Why are you mm-hmm. at college? OK, mm-hmm. you want to get you want to build tangible skills, build a community, build friendships, build a build a strong network and and get get uh, tangible results as you leave college, right? Okay. Get a role, get a job or, you know, uh, be able to start your own business with the folks you met at college, something along those lines. I haven't started okay. a business yet, so I don't know. But yeah, yeah. as, okay. Yeah, yeah as, as, as someone who's, go, who's thinking about going to college, you have to calculate them, do the math on it. You know, if someone who really wants to go to college, I recommend go to a community college first. The professors mm-hmm. are just as good, if not better than the ones at the university, right? Okay. And if you don't want to go to college route, see if you could find apprenticeships within within uh, within your community, um, within uh, within your city, you know, or yeah. or even online, uh, right? Even online, right? Like or LinkedIn, even online. You know, reach out to people on LinkedIn and see, like, hey, are you holding any any meetings that I could join virtually yeah. or whatever? Or you know, even if it's like, I mean, granted, I'm gonna put a little asterisk, even if it's searching for a mentor, asterisk. Because I think a lot of people get confused with, at least with mentorship. It's like, hey, I'm going to reach out to you, Abdi, to, uh, would you be my mentor? And then it's like, great, so you're going to do all the work for me. It's like a mentor mm. is not really there to do all the work, right? A mentor is really there to go ahead and help you sort of set up maybe a roadmap or maybe a, a big picture idea of what you need to do, what you need to really get done in order to be successful in your industry. But then you got to go ahead and actually put in the work, put in the time, consistent time every day, the discipline to mm-hmm. actually develop those skills right um but but that is something that is an option now that one can do digitally right so mm-hmm. um so then what i'm pretty much hearing with with a roadmap for just uh 18 year old abdi or anyone really looking to just start with an it is really first off decide whether or not it's in your means to go to college or not right and then from there if you go to college make sure you're networking, make sure you're taking advantage of opportunities that are on campus with maybe mm-hmm. either recruiters or different organizations provided on the campus. And even if you're not going to university, if you choose a non-university route, still network, but then find other resourceful ways to, to learn and develop skills, whether that's through an apprenticeship, uh, online, you know, LinkedIn, mm-hmm. other programs that are a little either more cost-effective or would just be a greater, as you said, a greater ROI on your time and on your on your financial investment as well, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, totally. Okay. Yeah, you, you nailed it. You know, and you know, certifications, pursuing certifications isn't bad either. Um, the thing about certifications is that they do expire, you mm-hmm. know, and then you got to recertify much cheaper than a college degree. But yes. the cool part about college degrees is they don't expire once you get it. Yes. You got it. It's done. done. You got the piece done. of paper. Right. You got the big piece of paper you're hanging up in your wall in your room and that's it. Right. Yeah. Uh, with certifications, I think certifications are pr- pretty, pretty uh, a, a great supplement to your learning. I don't think it should be looked at as an end all be all. Like if I get this certification, it guarantees me a job. It's more of yeah. if I get this certification and get these skills that come with, le- you know, caring, learning the certification, mm-hmm. then, yeah, I should I should be much more competitive. You yeah. gotta, you gotta look, it's kind of like a. Uh, Kind of look like like diet, I guess you know, or like supplements. Okay, you know, I see. Like, I mean, I see it more like showcasing. It's like you're showcasing, yeah. hey, I've I've reached the, I'm showing that I'm competent in this, 
you know, but like, just because I have the certification doesn't actually mean I'm competent. It's just more of like, yeah, it does, yeah. know the knowledge mm -hmm. and then yeah. get certified versus trying to get certified, but not actually knowing the actual knowledge and applying it. Yeah. Know? Which is, which is a very terrifying pitfall to be in where you get a certification and you, you don't even understand the basis of what you learned. Right. That's, huh. that's when the ROI of certification doesn't make sense. But yeah, true. I think, I think that that's, that's, that would be, if I was 18, I'd probably pursue some, some uh a, a few certifications to supplement my learning but i i really like that like you're talking about like a little bit of like that fear in getting certifications like it can actually be a scary thing even because if you take the time to just sort of learn the material but you just kind of understand like okay this is a b or c but you don't actually know the material now you have this certification on your resume and it's like great you have the certification on your resume but people are gonna try and pull you in for an interview and they realize wow you actually don't know the actual um, certification, you just got the certification. That makes oh, sense. Oh yeah, right? that's a terrible like feeling. You actually, right? Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a terrible feeling. Um, when you're in an interview and they ask you something verbatim, a topic from the certification that you mm -hmm. that you got. Are supposed to know. You're supposed to know, right? Yeah. Not even a hard one, but a basic basic mm -hmm. one that you're supposed to know and you're not able to answer. Yeah, it's, it's an awkward yeah. position. Which is why I don't okay. recommend you cheat on these certification exams. Yes, either. absolutely. <laughs> and, and really take the time to not only just like kind of know it, but like really, really know it, you know, like actually take the time to study and be able to just remember things from memory, not like from, from memory, from your own brain, not just like, oh yeah, it's A, B, or C, like multiple choice, oh, yeah. familiar, but like actually taking the depth to get to know it. Yeah. Interesting. Totally. Okay. Um, and so then, any roadmap specific for DevOps engineering that you would recommend that, you know, if, if you were to mentor a junior DevOps person, what yeah. tools or what strategy would you recommend for really diving into DevOps engineering specifically? That's, that's a great question. Um, I'm relatively new to DevOps, so I, I would, I would, you know, take my advice with a grain of salt. Okay. Um, I was going to say, we could take uh, it a step back. I mean, I know you have more experience in more of the security realm. So if, if you yeah. feel better discussing more security, we can do that instead. Gotcha. No, I, I can give a few tips, you know, for those of those of you who are trying to pivot into DevOps. Um, you know, if, if that's if that's what you want to do, then, you know, the, the formula, in my opinion, for getting into DevOps is. One, uh, learning, learning one programming language, you know, most job most job descriptions they list out uh either python bash scripting json yaml and uh understand basic networking fundamentals like tcp ip osi model how networks mm -hmm. communicate with one another and understand one cloud service provider i think those three things together those things make a devops engineer but the challenge with 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 job titles like devops is devops is very broad what do you mean by devops like you know um companies the, the responsibilities of a devops engineer vary you know mm. someone can have a devops engineer title but all they can do is the ops side of things but they're they're titled devops engineer Interesting. right okay. some folks uh, some folks are, are devops engineers but they're doing everything listed in the job description but they're doing more they're doing they're doing security work the dev sec ops side of things they're doing yes. development of the security and the operations but they're only but their title is dev dev devops engineer so mm -hmm. um interesting you know yeah i think i think if, if someone would, would want to get into that space i'd recommend you know get your networking fundamentals right uh pick up programming language you know and understand you know um understand one cloud service provider. You don't need to be an expert, but just, you know, a social level understanding of one cloud service provider. This could be GCP, Google Cloud, Google, Google, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft Azure, or, you know, AWS, those are, you know, those are the main hot ones. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I recommend that. And also understand that if you, if you want to get into DevOps, I mean, I'm relatively new to it, but I'd say is, you know, there's a lot of, freaking tools to learn you know there's a lot of tools mm -hmm. and not and not not just tools that you have to know one by one but tools that you have to know how they all work together for example okay. understanding how to use a infrastructure as code uh code tool like it's like terraform or ansible mm -hmm. you know and GitLab and, and using GitLab. so learn how to use GitLab, terraform and ansible together 
and Docker. Mm. You know, containerization. You know, you're learning one operating system. You gotta learn. Yeah, I forgot to mention that you gotta learn one operating system. So either Windows okay. or Linux, most likely Linux. Most likely, and, yeah. You know, and you'd have to learn at Docker. Uh, you know, uh, containerizations, containerization, okay. and you know, and also how to how to carry out container uh, container management using Kubernetes. And okay. you know, th those a lot of the tools I just listed. And it, it is, even, and it's a lot of special. tools. <laughs> yeah, no, it right. really is a lot of tools, but it's like you have to know how to, like you said, just piece them together, like know when to use X, Y, and Z, right? So you can just right. sort of integrate them together. Right. And, and, okay. yeah, and I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, you know, I mean, I, I do DevOps like about like 20% of my time, 30% of my time. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd say that it's uh, as a full, if, it, if I were to do a full time, I'd be under a lot more pressure because of how much the learning that, that, that comes with that, with that field. And, and, and I, and I, and I give my hat off to those those of you who are full time DevOps engineers, you know, because that's a lot of learning, a lot of tools, and and with tech evolving at a rapid pace, you know, it's 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 a lot, it's a lot yes. to learn. Because if you look Absolutely. at some of these job descriptions, obviously you don't need to have all the skills, but some of these job descriptions are like a laundry list. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. there's a lot of tools. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And so, so what would you say you mostly focus in on uh, at Lockheed Martin? My main focus, so mm -hmm. most of my time, I, I do cybersecurity work, working on embedded embedded weapon systems. Mm. And uh, it could range from carrying out, you know, security audits for uh, STIG, STIG compliance. So STIG compliance is a security technical implementation guides. And One more time. Security technical implementation guide. Okay, STIG, okay. Yeah, STIG, and, and it's pretty much, it's, it's by DISA, the Department of Information Security I forgot what the A stands for. <laughs> All these acronyms, right? Yeah, so much. Yeah, it's by DESA. So these these audits that we use a software called Nessus, and we carried out our security audits uh, based off of the Stig Stigs, and the Stigs are, are based off of NIST requirements. You know, NIST A hundred fifty three, and uh, pretty much these requirements. You know, these basic security baseline requirements are are, are going to be what standard that are going to be need to be met for your products that, that we're giving to our customer or giving to others, they have to meet a baseline set of requirements, security requirements. Okay. So I carry out these security audits, you know, get the results and see, you know, what, what level of, uh, what level of vulnerability, what level of issues, is it? is it a level three where it's like, it's not that big of a deal, like category three, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we can, we can, we can send this out to our customer and we can deliver mm -hmm. this, this server or product to our customer. Or is it a level one? Like, hey, no, this is actually a problem. We, this this asset can't leave production. We can't send okay. this out. This this people can get fired if we send it send it out as bad of a quality as this, right? Okay. You know, so I do a little bit of that, and I I I'm working with a bunch of a uh, bunch of other you know really smart folks working on building uh, some cybersecurity procedures and policies for nice. a new program okay. that I will not speak much about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> understood. Understood. Got it. Got it. Um. It, was this your first exposure with uh, embedded systems? Yes. This yeah, is, this okay. year, yeah, this year it was. This okay, year so, was. Yeah. so how was that uh, learning curve for you, uh, just learning embedded systems? And what, oh, it's, it's what, huge. what language? Uh, I'm assuming what x86 uh, is what you use for uh, your embedded systems? or? I mean, for me, um, probably, probably can't confirm or deny that, but I, I don't know. Okay, uh, okay. I... I, I for me, for the embedded system, for me, it was more of carrying out, you know, the security audits for the software of that embedded system, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, that's where, okay. that's where we, we work with software and systems engineers. And for me, most of my role was building, looking at NIST requirements and building out the appropriate security policies and procedures. For example, like we would have a, a software assurance, software security plan, like what, what tools will we have to make sure that our software works as it is intended and has minimal vulnerabilities. So that means, you know, okay. using a GitLab for SAS and DAS scanning, right? Using um, using a bunch of other tools, I forget their names, oh my God. But, um, but yeah, and also like a, a cyber verification plan. So working with system engineers, on uh, system engineers that have a bunch of uh, requirements that they need to meet as systems engineers. Mm. So and and the tests that they need to carry out to meet those requirements to fulfill those requirements. So there's a okay. security version of that of that uh, policy called a cyber verification plan. So all the 
all the security tests that need to be carried out to be in compliance with with NIST. Okay. Okay. Got it. And fulfill so, the, the system engineering requirements as well. Hmm, okay. So then, um, I'll come back to me. Come back to me. Here we go. Okay. Um, so where would you recommend then someone gets started if they're looking to dive further into more security auditing? Security auditing? Ooh, mm -hmm. that's a great question. Um, whether it's websites, whether it's books, whether it's people yeah. even, you know? Um, yeah, so the security auditing is, is more is more under the GRC realm, governance, risk, mm -hmm. and compliance. And you know, I don't have this cert in particular, but you know, I've heard good stories about this one. Okay. There's a there's the ISACA um, certified certified cert, certified security auditor. Okay, there's the auditor entry level auditor certification, and most mm. most folks who who do consulting for like uh, big four, you know, uh, De Deloitte. Uh, mm. Not Accenture, but Deloitte, uh, EY, KPMG. Okay. You know, yeah. I've had some friends there, and they they pursued that auditing certain. They they got to understand the fundamentals of a security audit. And uh, I would say, if you want to get into security auditing, you probably you know have a basic understanding of IT systems, but also understand that you know your job as a, as an IT auditor. Your job is not to cause a fire. Your job is to assess, you know, where, where exactly, you know, how compliant the system is, right? And also as an auditor, you don't want to be the person that just points to the problem and says, hey, you guys are not compliant, go mm -hmm. fix it. You, you mm -hmm. want to lean towards, hey, there's an issue and here's what we recommend on fixing it. So adding more really? value beyond the audit, which okay. is why so, for me, I'm... No, I was going to ask, so it's not even finding the issue it's giving a recommendation on how to how well that's to, well that's the that's the that's the most of the time when it comes to auditing is just finding mm -hmm. a problem and then pointing the finger and saying go fix it right mm -hmm. but i think in my opinion and my mentors you know they've, they've also shared this opinion is like hey if you're gonna be auditing the system you know give good feedback and give actionable advice you know mm -hmm. that way you're adding value beyond just pointing out the problem right Absolutely. you say hey no it, this is on fire go fix it so no hey this is on fire here's some here's a water bucket with water in it let's go help and fi fix this problem together so you're adding value beyond beyond that point you know in comparison to the traditional way of looking at auditing i think i think um security security audits the more understanding you have of the system the better you are as an auditor and the more uh, tangible consulting advice that you can give, which is why for me, I'm learning, I'm, I'm, I'm putting time into learn more cloud infrastructure, learn more DevOps, yeah. because for me, as someone who wants to be in the GRC, the GRC space long term, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be able to give actual advice on how engineers and, and the products that we build could be in compliance with, with requirements specified from whatever framework, whatever legal or law that's that's mm -hmm. going on but in an okay. effective manner instead of just pointing yeah. out the problem brilliant okay and what's your favorite thing about uh governance risk and compliance my favorite thing that's a great question and if you need some time too to think about it you know yeah, I, I need have a minute question. let me drink my water yeah. oh, go man. for it go for it absolutely <laughs> um i also wanted to ask do you have maybe three to five or even just one specific resource that you would recommend to someone who wants to get into auditing Hey, this website, this person, or this book, even. Mm, that's a great question. Um, so my favorite, I guess, my, for me, my my favorite part is because as someone in GRC, I get to interface with with different um, different engineers from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So system engineers, software engineers, safety engineers, um, electrical engineers, you know, mechanical engineers. You get to you get to the cool and GRC looks it doesn't look the same everywhere you go but you know you get to you get to be integrated with a lot of, with a lot of different teams and help and help mm -hmm. them with their issues I guess that's my favorite part I like people I like talking mm -hmm. you know as you can tell I love talking yes I absolutely I love connecting with others so when I get to work with meet new faces meet new teams and and figure out what what the team what they're working on you know what issues they're trying to solve. That makes my job easy. That makes my job easier. I ask myself, how can I make their their job easier instead of just bringing the problem? So, my favorite part is meeting new people and being being uh, working with different engineers from different disciplines. And then, as a resource, you know, for someone who's trying to get into GRC, I recommend you know on LinkedIn, 
you definitely need to follow AJ Yan. Um, he's he's a big big causing disruption in the compliance realm. I'm not sure if you how, follow how would you spell that. It's just straight up AJ. Yeah, AJ first name and then last name Yan Y A W N. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he's he's pretty big. He's pretty big on compliance, but he's he's very technically sound. He's a he's a CEO of this company called Bycheck, and they're a compliance uh, compliance company that help uh, that help different uh, businesses with their SOC two compliance. And and uh, I would say he's a great uh, um, person to follow on LinkedIn. I'd also follow follow Gerald Oger. Gerald Oger. He goes by Jerry. He's really really great great resource. Uh, you could find. I mean, the thing about Jerry though. He's a multidisciplinary cyber guy. Like he, he, he touches on every cyber topic, whether that's, mm. you know, pen testing, red team versus blue team, mm -hmm. you know, incident response, uh, mm. you know, and, and GRC, like the whole, the whole. So it gives whole, a good breath. Yeah, good breath. But I, I'd say okay. uh, he's one of the few content creators on YouTube space that give good oh. GRC content. And I believe he has, a, he has a GRC course. I've heard great things about as well. Okay. Highly recommend, you know, first check out his YouTube GRC content. And then, you know, if you if you feel that his content is good now and you're confident in it, I would recommend taking his GRC course, which is pretty, in my opinion, pretty affordable. And I think he gives di massive discounts as well. OK. And what's his name one more time? Gerald Oger. So he spelled it G-E-R-A-L-D, last name Oger, A as an apple, U-G-E-R. OK, Gerald Oger. Oh, yeah or simply I, cyber I, that's that's his youtube channel simply cyber. simply cyber okay great and and i love the rote memory of like you actually have the names memorized and such because i know we're having you spell a lot so i appreciate i appreciate it now i actually wanted to dive a little bit into how did you uh really transition into lockheed martin yeah, that's a great question so so like starting out or like like going um, from i guess from undergrad getting into lockheed yeah, let's do that. Let's go with that. Yeah, so, so yeah, uh, last year of college, you know, I'm, I'm, I joined this organization called National Society of Black Engineers. Mm -hmm. So the National Society of Black, Black Engineers, also acronym is NSBE. So they're an organization, uh, uh, an organization that was founded, you know, way back in the 70s by uh, young, uh, young Black uh, STEM majors, engineers, who wanted to create and wanted to create and cultivate and nurture black talent, you know, individuals who are African American slash black, mm -hmm. who wanted to get into engineering spaces and create more more engineers that you know, come from from the black community. And uh, Nesby is not is 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 not exclusive to black people. There are people who are not black that are in Nesby, but the organization's its original founding was to get more more black folks into the tech space, mm -hmm. you know, into the engineering realm, and you know, I joined that organization. I started getting very active, you know, throughout throughout my senior year. And I'm applying for different jobs. Resume is really not that good, to be honest. Mm -hmm. My interviewing skills are really not that good either at that time. And I was about to say, I was like, man, I would say your, your people skills are, are really solid. So I'm just surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was quite quite the experience, you know, just not being able to land roles all the way until, you know, spring spring and the reason why i say it was spring because it was in spring of march where nesby the national society of black engineers mm -hmm. they had a, a national convention so at their national convention a bunch of companies come so we're, we're talking about again north grumman boeing facebook oh not meta amazon uh you name it uh l3 harris mm -hmm. any company you could think of delta you know any company chick-fil-a any company you could think of, they're hiring for uh, across various industries, right? They're hiring for for talent at this convention, and the goal of this convention is pretty much they interview talent at this convention during the career fair at the convention. Mm -hmm. They interview you and they give you offer on the spot, you mm -hmm. know. And you know that's like most people will talk about how they have to go through four, five, six, seven, eight interviews sometimes on LinkedIn, and then saying how they have to go through all these hoops. But, you know, at a, wow. at a conference such as the Nesby convention, you know, mm -hmm. you give your resume, you upload your resume, you know, about a month or two before you go to the convention. And, you know, they say, hey, we want to interview you. You interview them, you know, at wow. the convention. They interview you at the convention. You know, you go through one or two rounds. Sometimes, depends on, mm -hmm. you know, on the company, but my interviews were all one or, one or two rounds. And boom, mm -hmm. it's done. 
you know, the and deal it was done. right. Was it the same day? Same day. Yeah. They're like, hey, like, you know, well, you'll get a verbal offer. But as mm-hmm. far as like the offer letter, that might take a little bit more time. Yeah. But, but get a like the rounds, but like the two rounds were both in that same day. In that same day. Yeah. In that same day. Wow. And, you know, I, 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 I interviewed with Google, Accenture, Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Those are the four companies I interviewed with. Uh, Google, I didn't, Google interview, I didn't do too well. Google, they, they, they do a lot of digging. They, they keep digging and digging, but you know, huh. it just, it just, I just wasn't at the level that they need me to, yeah, like need to be depth. to work at Google. Yeah. The depth okay. that they needed, which is fine, you know, uh, but I got job offers from the other companies I just mentioned and, you know, Lockheed Martin for me made the most sense. I say, Hey, I want to work in the cybersecurity space. Lockheed yeah. Martin is giving me an opportunity. They, they're paying me a decent amount and it's in Florida. And I, I moved from California to Florida and started my career at Lockheed. Wow, how cool. That, that's such a cool little hack. But it's like, again, you got to be resourceful sometimes when it comes to like, just especially getting your foot in the door. Just be resourceful. If you, if you have resources, right, like Nesby, you know, take yeah. advantage, right? Like, wow, that, that is really cool. That's such a cool little like, quote unquote, hack, you know? Interesting. Okay. No pun intended, wow. right? <laughs> well, yeah, no pun intended, but it's no like, wow, like because you're right. Because with a lot of roles, you have to do three, four, five, six. I've heard the crazy, craziest I've heard is like seven um, yeah. rounds. And it's and it's for, not and it's not even executive level positions. It's like regular it's like, positions. It's in, it's so many different hurdles just for like one role. It's like, and that and that's like a, a more common thing nowadays where it's like you know it can be like you said a more associate level role it's still seven hoops you got to jump through just to land that role you know yeah, and then not, i don't think it's effective and, and no, no. honestly it's like i don't even personally i'm i don't mind the seven hoops but then it's like but it takes so much time for people you know because some mm-hmm. people you know are trying to work as early as possible as soon as possible you know right especially right now there's so much fluidity in job roles and in the job market you know both for employees and employers why yeah. not make it better for everybody you got to have seven hoops just make it all on the same day right like or like yeah you said, yeah you have two hoops all in one day and they offer you a verbal yes i think that's really cool you know i think that that could be a, a i think that's a lot more beneficial for people anyways yeah how interesting um i also saw on your linkedin you were asking uh, a question. So I wanted to ask you the question. Um, how do you like to stay informed in the cybersecurity field? Yeah, that's a great question. That's 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 probably the I best question. One. Like, period. In the, like, in, really, in like, cybersecurity, you got to be a lifelong learner. You gotta you gotta read books and you gotta mm-hmm. use internet to your advantage. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know, staying informed is is so important because yeah, tech is evolving at a fast pace. You have to mm-hmm. you have to keep learning. It doesn't necessarily mean you get another degree in certification. It could mean you having a conversation like this, mm-hmm. you know, um, you're you're on you're on LinkedIn, you know, commenting and look, reading articles, you know. Um, for me, I, I usually just just go on YouTube and and type in like cyber news or something. And mm-hmm. most of the time, Gerald Alger he pops up, the the, the okay. guy I mentioned. Yes. He has a daily daily cyber threat brief, and he just. For wow. about 45 minutes to an hour every day during the weekday, he's he's giving up updates in the cybersecurity space. So it can go from like big hacks that just happened mm-hmm. or, you know, lawsuits. You know, I think he was discussing the Twitter lawsuit recently as well. That was really mm-hmm. good. And just anything cyber, he's discussing. He's discussing it. It. You okay. know, data, information mm-hmm. security, he's discussing it. And that's one way for me. I, I stay informed. How I stay informed. Also stay informed. I... I'm on LinkedIn, you know, I'm just, you know, reading through, you know, going mm-hmm. through, scrolling through my feed, look at the cyber pro, see what they're doing. That's how I keep gotcha. on as well. I'm okay. pretty sure they always have something to share, something new to share. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Especially worth your time, right? Like, cause there's so many different incidents that can happen in a day. Oh it's yeah. Like, you know, at least you get like the main gist of what's really, you know, keeping a pulse on things, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, the internet's a great tool, you know, to stay informed you know, look out, just you can literally Google cybersecurity news and there's something news popping up okay. all the time. I think that's yeah. that's one way you can do that. And, you know, that, I think that's probably the easiest way to stay informed, watching mm-hmm. a YouTube channel that gives daily updates or yes. just scrolling through reading an article on LinkedIn mm-hmm. or going on Google, type in cyber news. Mm-hmm. And, and for anybody who's also just like wants to 
learn even more. I've heard podcasts are also a big thing. Um, oh, podcasts! Yeah, so oh, I how, how can I forget there. podcasts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you listen to Do you listen to uh, any consistently yourself? Or well, cyber podcasts? No, no? I should okay. probably start though. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, like, actually, I, no, I listen no, no, to a there, couple. There, there is one cyber podcast I listen to from time to time. That's okay. a cloud security podcast. Okay. Cloud security podcast is by this uh, this gentleman of the name Ashish Rajan and his wife. I believe her name is Shipley. Mm-hmm. I, I hopefully I'm not I'm not butchered. <laughs> I do apologize if I mess it up. But um, it's cloud security podcast where they talk all things cloud cloud security, and okay. you know they do a great job of interviewing folks, having their own discussions. And, you know, I think they're both pretty seized. I be- they are. No, I don't believe it. they are seasoned <laughs> cybersecurity professionals who know what they're talking about. So okay. highly recommend you lo- you all look it up. Follow Ashish or John and, and his wife uh, on LinkedIn and, and follow, uh, follow him on YouTube. Their YouTube channel is called Cloud Security Podcast. They work on it together and it's a beautiful piece of art. Okay, wonderful. I'll make sure to ch- take a look at that. I don't think I've... I don't think that was on my radar, but now it is. So I'll definitely check that out. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then I know you also talk a little bit about uh, imposter syndrome. You know, so uh, when have you doubted your, when have you faced your own imposter syndrome? And what advice would you have for someone who's perhaps currently facing imposter syndrome? That's a great question. I think the first time where it hit me really hard in terms of like work and career was, um, Probably like uh, I I'd say like the end of my senior year as I'm applying for jobs and I'm getting mm-hmm. a bunch of no's and denial letters. Mm-hmm. Imposter syndrome kicks in pretty heavy. Uh, that scenario I just kept applying and finally something cracked, something worked right. Okay. And you know obviously got good feedback from mentors about my resume and they helped me get my act together, get my interviewing skills sharp and where they needed to be to close uh, close deals on on job interviews. Mm-hmm. As for like career wise, yeah, I think my, my first job in cyber, yeah, I felt like an imposter. And I think the reason why we feel imposter syndrome is because I think it's because the idea we, we think we're immediately supposed to be good at anything we do. You just got started. Why, why would you why would you be why would you be so, you know, um, why would you be so hard on yourself you just started you're learning something new you're not supposed to be an expert in a day you know there are folks who've been in this industry uh been in the the field of tech 10 20 30 years and they still still tell you i'm still learning i'm still i'm still growing i'm still absolutely today is day one right I, i'm exactly. still i'm still get, getting to it and i think uh the reason why we feel imposter syndrome is because we we put all this pressure on ourselves and we think that we're supposed to know everything on day one i think understanding one one, you know, you're not going to know everything. And two, mm-hmm. you got to give yourself a little grace because you have to, are you doing, are you putting in the work? Are you learning? Are you trying your best? You are, okay, then it's going to take some time. You can't rush, you can't rush time, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to have a director level of managerial experience, mm-hmm. you know, unless I put in the time to lead exactly. teams. That's just mm-hmm. not, Right. Yeah. I'm not going to come. I'm not going to come out of college you know, being able to lead teams of engineers if I haven't done the work that they've done to some capacity. Gotcha. Right. OK. So mm-hmm. understanding that, hey. I'm doing what I, I'm doing the best I can. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this just means I'm pushing myself. I'm learning something new. I think okay. imposter syndrome is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If you understand that you're learning something new, you're being whether, oh, I'm doing something new, which is why I feel this imposter syndrome, right? Gotcha. Okay. And once you understand that, like, okay, well, I need to keep working hard so I can get more imposter syndrome because that means mm-hmm. I'm pushing myself. If you yeah. want to know how hard you're pushing yourself, do you feel like an imposter to a degree? Not completely, but to a degree. Do you feel yes. a little imposter syndrome? Do you, do you feel a little incompetent? Then that then that's where you need to yes. be. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think there's always this, uh, uh, I've read by a couple of different uh, psychologists, there's like this utility of the fool where, you know, it's, it's sort of important to actually be a fool to some degree, you know, mm-hmm. having the self-awareness, obviously to be like, no, no, I'm competent in some things, but also having the humility to say, no, no, I'm a fool in certain things because that allows you to sort of learn a little more to play with ideas and such. So I definitely think utility in the fool is a little important and, and absolutely. Um, and then also, cause you, you spoke about how a few years ago, you know, you didn't 
really even have the, the soft skills to communicate, even though right now I feel like we're having a great, wonderful conversation. Um, what would you say were are some tidbits for, especially for people, you know, with an IT, I think there's that mindset of like people who are in tech or just like these geeky nerds who are just always on a computer and such. What uh, advice would you share for someone who wants to just further develop their, their soft skills in mainly in communication, mm -hmm. uh, whether, whether or not they want to be a manager, but just being a more effective communicator? That's a great question. That's a great question. I think, I, I believe in my opinion, I think, I think, you know, there are some of us, we have, uh, we, we, some of us, it's easier for us to be extroverted than, intro, mm -hmm. than introvert. Some of us are more introverted. You know, I'm not, I, I would never say an introvert needs to become an extrovert. It's more yeah. of, hey, you're like, how can you work on your weaknesses where you can get them high enough level where you could, you could do better work, right? You could do better, okay. you can get better outcomes. And I think if you, if you want to work on your communication skills, you know, you got to be very comfortable meeting new people and talking to new people. You know, you got to be, you, you just got to keep doing it. And for me, that's how it came. Like you have to okay. meet people. You have to have conversations. You have to, you know, me and you, we, we've never had a long conversation before. This is our mm -hmm. first long conversation, right? Absolutely, yeah. You have to be comfortable with having long conversations with people you've never met, you know, getting to know people asking deeper questions, you know, I think okay. to, to sharpen your communication skills, you have, to, you have to meet new people, you have to, you have to practice, right, you have to practice your communication yeah. skills by talking and meeting new people, and number mm -hmm. two, you have to, you have to read, right, reading is, is, is fundamental, you have mm -hmm. to read, and number three, it's part of number two, but study great communicators, study Absolutely. great communicators, who are the most, who are the most dangerous and most competent communicators that you know of, right, Okay. Look it up. There are there are people who are world class communicators. You know, if it's hard to find any executive who mm -hmm. was not working on their communication skills all the time. Absolutely, yeah. it's hard to find any sales professionals not working on their a competent sales professional work on their communication skills. So, yeah. if if you really want to improve improve your communication skills, it's something you have to practice. And the way you practice that is by reading meeting new people all the time and studying great communicators in my opinion okay absolutely and i want to make sure are you, can we go a little over is that okay or yeah that's fine we're good that's on fine. time we're good on time yeah. okay great so then uh what books would you recommend or even uh communication role models have you tend to observe throughout your uh, communication development that's and it could question. be you know it could be a parent like like because i try to think about that myself like uh you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm like the best, I was naturally like the best communicator, but I think observing whether growing up, whether it was parents or observing, uh, you know, family members or friends, I think that person helped me as well, just come out of my shell a little more and just be a more effective communicator. So it could be anyone for you really like that you just think right away, wow, I think they're a really great communicator. And yeah, also think, what books, um, what books you recommend? For sure. I think for me, um... Excuse me. I'd say my dad's a great communicator. My dad's communication skills are are razor sharp. He knows he knows mm -hmm. how to read the room and he knows exactly what to say at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. My dad, yeah, love my yeah. dad. Yeah, he's, he's a great communicator. Uh, and yeah. I would I would add people that I watch who are excellent communicators. Joe Rogan, I think Joe Rogan's one of the best communicators yeah. out there. He knows he knows how to communicate. He knows how to be quiet, interview people, and listen. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he he just knows how to talk to people very well. I'd say I'd say Jocko Willink. Jocko yes. Willink Navy. So you're familiar with Jocko, yeah. yes? Yeah, I got his book right here. Discipline equals freedom. Yeah, yeah. I'd say love see. Jocko Willink. He's great, definitely a big role model for me personally. So if you haven't heard of Jocko Willink, please go check him out. Even if you don't read his books, just check out some of his content. It'll yeah. be definitely uh, very life-changing for sure. Yeah, he's a, he's a life-changing person. That's just the type of guy he is. And, mm -hmm. and his communication skills, I mean, you've seen it, like his communication skills during a podcast discussion with his speeches, the way he carries himself, it's very like razor sharp. Like he's mm -hmm. very comfortable communicating to large groups of people like it's nothing. Absolutely. You know? He's so but, articulate and just like today, 
we are going to execute this. Mm-hmm. He'll take up like that pause and he just like, yep. <laughs> he just like, all eyes are on him. He can, he can take 30 seconds to just say two words and it's just like, he'll still grab your attention, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, he's, and, he's just that type of person. And, yeah. you know, I think Jocko's books, all of Jocko's books, I recommend. Yeah. You know, if you want to improve your communication specifically, mm-hmm. uh, I would say the, it's, it's the book with Leif Babin. It was the, the leadership uh, book. I forget oh, the title. Um, yes. Uh, it was right after Discipline Equals Freedom. It, it, was, was, not, it was before the dichotomy of leadership. I was thinking of that one. Okay. So it was right before that. They, they had two. Before the dichotomy of leadership, Jocko Willink. On, I, gotta look I, I can look up. it up. <laughs> Jocko Willink books. Extreme Ownership. Yes, extreme ownership. Extreme ownership. Extreme okay. ownership, and I think yeah. that's that's a great book. Um, it gives, you learn you learn a lot of leadership skills, mm-hmm. but also you learn as a leader why it's important to assess the situation before you know before making an executive decision. You know, mm-hmm. I think okay. that and, and owning that decision as a leader, I think that's yes. very important. Yes. I, I think being a, being a good communicator and and being in leadership go hand in hand. You can't Absolutely. be you can't be a great leader or competent leader if you can't communicate well. So Absolutely. I would recommend uh, yes. uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. And even if even if you're not interested in reading, you know, just check out some of Jocko Willink's TED Talks. Um, I know that there's a TED Talk he talks about extreme accountability, as he says, mm-hmm. extreme ownership. So even if, if you know, you don't want to put in a couple hours for reading, check it out. It's like a 20 minute video, you know, um, and definitely a lot of lessons in that video. So I, I second that as well. Um, yeah. So. I actually didn't know you you read and you're, you're into books as well. Um, what would you say either a handful of books uh, that you personally just always geek out about that you could always consistently talk about and absolutely love? I would say I just finished a really good one by Dr. Mansour Hasib. It was called Cybersecurity Leadership. Mm-hmm. And it goes over, you know, Cyber, the whole spectrum of cybersecurity leadership. Like it goes from like what the role of a chief information officer is, what's the role of a chief security officer, mm. you know, what are the roles of, you know, different uh, folks in the IT, IT organization, you know, mm. why IT, why IT's goal is to not, to not uh, make itself a priority, but make the business a priority and enable yeah. the business. Okay. You know, and he he goes and talking about, you know, salary ranges, you know, salary negotiation, like a bunch of plethora of different topics that one I would I believe you would need, you know, down the line if you want to get into cybersecurity leadership route. I believe his book is pretty, pretty great. Great book. Um I would say and they don't have to be uh cybersecurity, by the way. I just want to make sure you know, like oh okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Any any books that you personally because as a human too, I think there's also an important aspect of like just learning those soft skills of, of being an individual as well, I think are also important. So just gotcha. any books in general that you personally, which is like, wow. Oh man, you know. the book for me, uh, that was really great for me was The Way of the Superior Man by David mm-hmm. Dita. That okay. book talks about, you know, um, it talks about a plethora of different, you know, human, uh, human male, female dynamics, but more importantly, how, you know, how to transition from boy to man and what does that entail? And I just, that book was really great on, you know, just manhood, you know, what it means to be a man and, and a virtuous superior man. So the concept of being a superior man is being um, virtuous, respectful, you know, uh, being honest, being competent, and also, mm-hmm. and also, you know, being responsible. That book for me, you know, really, really uh, changed the trajectory of my life. Hmm. Um, I would say Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, is also really good. I think yeah. though, that book, uh, it's a self-development. I'm going to the self-development space now. But, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I got a couple I got a couple copies of his book somewhere, yeah. somewhere in the bookshelf. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think the Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, it, it, it's a really good book if, if, for anyone, man, male or female, man or woman who, who wants to read a book and who wants to get a framework for their life. I think that book is pretty good. Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. He goes into each 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 rule he, he dives deep into those topics he draws mm-hmm. upon his own experiences 
draws upon historic experiences, draws upon his, bibl- uh, not his, but like he draws upon biblical experiences. His inter- and his interpretations. And his interpretations of said yeah. things. And, and, he artic- and, and he uses that as evidence for why this rule is a viable rule. And I think that, mm-hmm. that, that yeah, that makes it a great book. Yeah, yeah those, I think those, those, those three come to mind. Absolutely. Okay. I, 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 I agree with you on that. The, uh, or I s- not agree and this, but more of a, I second that as well of uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson's uh, 12 Rules for Life. I read both and I absolutely really enjoy his work. And, and you read Triumph. Beyond Order? Yeah, I read Beyond Order. I need um, to read that book. It's yeah. great. I love it. Um, like some people yeah. say, I don't know. Like I, I sometimes I go back and forth of like, sometimes I like the second one more, sometimes I like the first one more. Yeah. Um, but just overall, I, th- I think they're just both really great books. Again, it's still the same style, just different rules, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, I would definitely, if you love the first one, yeah, check out the second one, you know, p- put that on your uh, priority list of, uh, of books to read. Cause yeah, I mean, it's, it's Dr. Jordan Peterson, right? He's, if you already love his first work, his second work, I'm sure will be great too. Yeah. Um, get that book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate your time today, Abdi. Really great, insightful conversation on uh, so many different uh, areas. So I really appreciate and uh, thank you for your time today. Yeah, likewise. I, pre- I appreciate having this conversation with you. Um, looking forward to getting to know you better and and uh, and watching more of your content. I hope to see more more interviews with other tech professionals as well. And you know, absolutely. Where, where, where can we find? You? Where can we find? You? <laughs> well, I was going to ask, where can we find you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on that's LinkedIn. The, my main social media handle. It's my first name, last name. So, Abdul Rahman, last mm-hmm. first name, uh, a last name Muhammad M O H A M E D. And, uh, and I'll yeah, make sure to put free, links too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah, feel free to connect with me if you have any questions on okay. breaking into cybersecurity. You know, um, I'm not I'm no expert, but I think I I, I, I can give you I can hopefully give you some some uh, some tangible advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Abdi.